curiosity, I think, is in a way, um, it's like the leading edge of love. It's how you love people with your intelligence. You try to get to know them better. You try to get to know their problems better. So just being kind and loving in general with all the people around you means being quick to be curious. Oh, like what's hard? Like what's the, like what's the what's the issue here? I also think it means that we don't quickly um, jump in to like give them solutions. Before we get started, if you enjoy these episodes, you might want to check out more at optimwork.com. Our website offers unique content, tools, and exercises to help you thrive at work and beyond. We have an in-depth masterclass covering our entire theory of growth, daily recommendations for personalized advice, and a platform to help groups and organizations learn and practice optimal work together. You can get a free trial at optimwork.com. Now let's start the episode. Hey, this is Sharif here with another episode of the Optimal Work Podcast, joined by Dr. Kevin Majors. Kevin, good to be back here with you again. Hey, Sharif, great to be back. Yeah, Kevin, well, uh, you recently found, uh, shared it with me, an article in Harvard Business Review on the role, the potential role of CBT and therapy and these different approaches to psychology in the workplace. So I thought it could be good to discuss that article and compare and contrast it with our own approach in the coaching class on optimwork.com. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, what, what's, I don't know, maybe we just start by summarizing their approach and how, the, how they see CBT in the workplace. Well, just to set the stage then for it, the reason they're talking about CBT is because it has been shown repeatedly to be the gold standard for psychological interventions. There was, uh, in 2019, there was a systematic review of 34 randomized control trials of CBT for anxiety and depression, showing basically that it does have a clear, um, significant effect. Now, so CBT works. We know it works. In fact, we also know that it can be delivered by people with a minimum of training because there have been studies of having healthcare people that are not in the field of mental health deliver CBT in say third world countries or places where, you know, where there just aren't CBT therapists available. And those have also shown some promising results. Um, and then they also have this idea that because there is a, um, you can have apps that help people in a CBT way, kind of proving therefore that anything works. Like you have to, if you deli are delivering CBT to people, they get better because these apps also, have, some of them have been, you know, have their own, probably not like randomized control trials, but there are, there are, there's evidence these, these apps work and okay. So like their conclusion from all of that then is managers could be the ones to give first aid CBT when they see an employee in distress. And this has been a theme recently, just to say in Harvard Business Review, um, there's a much greater emphasis recently on mental health issues in the workplace. And that's a general trend, and especially the September, October issue. Kevin, could, sorry, just to back up a little bit, I guess, um, one, it, it might be helpful to also clarify why they're even talking about applying CBT in the workplace. I think they're uh, prompted by, you know, rising rates of say anxiety or depression in the general population. And then also noting that that impacts people's work, right? Uh, that there's a relationship between those two things. Yeah. Th it's now astounding the rates of anxiety and diagnosable anxiety disorders, you know, in some populations is approaching 50%. So there is a recognition that there's like, people are awash in anxiety and depressive symptoms, and that these often are showing in the workplace. And in fact, many managers have faced the question of like, what should I do if, let's say I go into a conference room and there's an employee crying, which is then the scenario that in this, in this article in HBR that they go through of what, you know, like a manager goes into a conference room and finds an employee crying and then they kind of go like, what should the manager be doing with this employee? And that's kind of the, that's kind of the setup. But it's an important thing. Like, think everyone you know can think of their place of work 
And if you were to come across someone crying, what's the best way to respond? Is there like a first aid, you know, quote unquote, that that you should be providing to that person? Because um, it would seem kind of cold just to go up to the person and say, I think you need professional therapy. That would be like pretty, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty tough, right? So, but like, but I think like, so what can they do? That's, that's the question. Yeah. And, and is, is the right approach then to, to give the therapy yourself, <laughs> which is, seems like quite the leap. Yeah, exactly. Yep. That's, that's, that's the question. And so they have this model then for how they're telling managers they should intervene. I'll try to like briefly outline it. I think the, they say that there are um, three steps, acknowledge, respond, and change. So there's these, these, these three different steps. If people are going to check out the article, I'll just say that it's pretty unclear to me like what's in each step because sometimes things appear in multiple steps. And then sometimes it's said like, for instance, acknowledging has two steps within it. Uh, so the first is to um, acknowledge that the person is in distress, which is like, hey, I see that you're having a hard time. You sit down and then you know, give them time to respond. Well, that's great. And then the second thing they say is to identify the vicious cycles that are maintaining the distress of the employee. Which, um, and for doing that, they have a four square technique, which is not, it's not like four square when you're talking about decision making. Uh, it's actually the, the hot crossed bun model, which is a very British thing to describe uh, having four, four boxes. And so, because I think that's what they, that's like a, in America, we don't really have hot cross buns as far as I know. Um, but uh, yeah, I know it's, it gets stuck in the head. Uh, so you have uh, the thoughts the person's having, the emotions they're having, the feelings in their body, and then the behaviors that they're doing. And the idea they have is that the manager could like have them work with them and make this four square. Like, okay, what are all the thoughts you're having right now? Tell me about the emotions and what, you know, how you're experiencing these emotions and any other feelings in your body. And you describe whatever is happening in your body. And then what are you doing? Um, looking for maintenance cycles or what we call in optimal work lingo, vicious cycles. What is contributing and making it worse? So you try to then help identify for the person like, okay, here's where your avoidance is only making it harder to do the thing and it leads to more avoidance and becomes more and more challenging the more you avoid it. That's a very clear vicious cycle. In fact, in some way, that's, that's every vicious cycle. Uh, and so, okay, all of that is, which is a lot, is, is what they call step one, acknowledging. Mm -hmm. It doesn't okay. seem like that would be uh the right thing to do with someone that you encounter crying in a meeting room well yeah that's <laughs> to me that would be it's it, the whole thing is like uh is is unusual i'll just briefly mention then the, the, responding means um empathy and active listening which i'm not sure how that can take place after having them do a four square of, of the <laughs> you know to describe all these things and then you're supposed to then you do a step of active listening and then the last is called changing. And by changing, they mean helping them with reframing. Um, and the other is behavioral changes that they have to take place, like doing more yoga um, or reading enjoyable books or finding, like, come up, come up with behavioral strategies. Uh, and so, and by, by reframing, they're talking about you have to help them to first identify their negative thoughts and then challenge them and then replace them with more positive ones. Uh, so like in, in some ways, this would be the, um, the very reason I think that managers shouldn't be doing CBT. That the, the very way of laying it out, how managers would do it, has in some ways all, like what are the, the biggest difficulties with CBT? And one difficulty is that uh, it's a little bit inhuman and impersonal. And sometimes that can be a real criticism of how CBT is, is taught and how CBT is done so that it can seem formulaic, you know, that, okay, here's the formula that we do with everyone. And then you have this kind of stilted and unusual interaction 
based on filling out worksheets. So I, to me, this is like this, this, this approach is, which is being offered like in a very kind of famous journal for how managers can be helping their employees. In fact, I think highlights all the real problems with how CBT is taught and how, and how it's conceived. Um, and particularly that there's no real acknowledgement of what is the nature of the relationship between a manager and an employee? And is it within the boundaries of that relationship to do cognitive behavioral therapy with the person? So that's, a, I think, a huge question. Before we continue, a brief message. If you're benefiting from these discussions, please take a moment to hit like and subscribe. Doing so helps us to reach more people. So you're not just learning, you're also helping others to discover a path of growth and flourishing. Thanks for your support. Yeah, because it seems like the the manager is the person responsible for, you know, say, reviewing their performance. So that is always going to be in the background of a conversation like this. Yeah, like the reason we have therapists, yeah, is because they have uh-huh. nothing. They, there's no interaction outside of therapy. Mm-hmm. That's like the whole goal of like having therapy is that there's someone. In fact, if you had a social connection with a therapist, you should not see them. And when I do my malpractice insurance, they ask me the question, do you have any social relationships with your patients outside of the relationship? And it's like a risk factor. Like, so um, now sometimes like it happens that there are people I know that reach out to me for help, but actually I don't disclose names, but I have to say how many times that's occurred just because they want to get a sense like, like, is this cause it's considered to be risky. They understand that it's going to happen sometimes and that people will reach out to you and that it can be okay. And you, the only thing is you have to keep a medical record. So they're not saying you can never do it, but it's just to highlight that having a therapy relationship is a very different kind of thing where like you wouldn't go to a therapist who could fire you if you're not compliant with therapy. Like, not fire you from their practice, but fire you from your job. <laughs> so. Right, right. So, so how does that differ then from the coaching class? Because we're encouraging people within a work context to help each other grow, and especially a manager with their direct reports, or maybe a coach within the organization. But I think we leave it open that hey, this could be a manager helping to mentor uh, his or her direct reports. So one, one way that we structured the coaching class, uh, is that the setting for it is someone is coming to you for help, asking you to help them to grow in some way. The nature of that request determines then what follows. Like, so is the way that they're wanting your help within kind of, does does it fit? So for instance, um, a student could go to a professor and say, I'm having like difficulty understanding understanding this concept. Like, and can you can you help me with it? Or in general, I'm having difficulty writing essays the way you want me to be able to write them. Well, that would be then an, an example of a situation where if the professor had done the coaching class, I think they would actually have the best way of helping that student. You know, and it doesn't mean doing therapy, but it does mean that they try to understand fully what is the what's the challenge that this person is facing, and then how is this challenge an opportunity for this person to grow, and then come up with a practical plan for that growth. Well, that's exactly what you would want a professor to do. You'd want the professor, if you were that person, if you were that student, you would want the professor to be thinking, oh, yeah, what's the real challenge here? Maybe it's not just writing essays. Maybe it's actually being able to clearly understand the ideas or to to be able to um, think more thoroughly through the prompt. Maybe it's how they're jumping to a quick conclusion rather than pausing and and being more thorough. But all of that is the professor's job, right? And so it's, now it is coaching, but it's completely within the relationship that professor and student would have. Um, Or if, if, if it was an employee going to a manager and saying, I am so stressed out because I'm not making my sales targets. Like, you know, and, you know, this is, this is really weighing on me. Could you help me with this? 
then again, you'd want the manager to be fully understanding and encouraging and practical. What's the real challenge? How is this your greatest opportunity for growth? And then practical steps to do it. And that I think would be being just the ideal manager. But if the, if, if the student were going to the professor for dating advice, or if um, the employee were going to the manager for help with getting elder care for their, their aging mother, that might be inappropriate. And that's not really the, the kind of help that the person is there. Now, it could be that they're friends outside of work, in which case maybe there could be more openness to that. But I think that's a little bit tricky anyway to have those yeah. kind of tangled friendships. Yeah. Okay. So, so what makes our approach different from CBT at work is that the content or the matter that we're focusing on is work related. I mean, it's where it, what's relevant to that relationship, which is in the case of the manager with the employee, it's their kind of shared goals as a team, what, what they're working on. I can just jump in real quick and say the, another, but another point there is that the approach that we're talking about is not formulaic, but it is focused on the ideals that you would want to be informing the interaction. And that means we're not trying to tell them here is the right way of doing it. First, have them lay out all the thoughts they're having and then see all the emotions, then the feelings in their body and so on. Like that, that's, that's like applying a formula. Um, and there's, that doesn't correspond, I think, to any ideal. Now, it, could, it may be being understanding, but it's like an odd way of going about being understanding with another person. So I think we keep things human by keeping ideals front and center. And the first ideal is to be understanding as deeply as you can. That means being validating. So in order to be validating to others, you have to genuinely be curious to be thinking like, what, how is this person seeing their problem right now? So uh, curiosity, I think, is in a way, um, the, it's like the leading edge of love. It's how you love people with your intelligence. You try to get to know them better. You try to get to know their problems better. So just being kind and loving in general with all the people around you means being quick to be curious. Oh, like what's hard? Like what's the, like what's the what's the issue here? I also think it means that we don't quickly um, jump in to like give them solutions. So which I think is like sometimes as soon as we see like a difficulty, it's like oh well, have you tried this or how about doing this? Um, and so. Anyway, I think being, but the ideals of being curious, being compassionate, um, showing confidence that the person is able to do, is able to do whatever is being asked. Those are all, uh, to me, very human ways of improving interactions. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned that uh, typically the coaching class is going to be helpful when someone comes to you for help. And this is definitely something that I've heard a lot is that you can't really force change on people. Kind of change has to come from within that person. Um, so, but, uh, but uh, you know, I wonder in the case of a manager that hey, they, they see ways that, say, that their employees need to grow. Maybe it's just because they know more about the role and the, their employees' career trajectory and you know what the next steps are needed or because they see hey our team in order to be successful we need this person to produce more or something of that nature um so it, it, can you use these strategies this approach of being understanding encouraging and practical um just of your own initiative or, or does it really have to be that the employee comes to you for help it could be that you and the employee if you're the manager, will be coming together to like the recognition that the person does need help. So you might have to structure a conversation, like for this, this would happen in the case of say an annual review, to point out the areas for growth. Well, that's that's an important moment then, but it's not that the the annual review shouldn't be like highlighting your criticisms of the person. It could be instead a much more positive uncovering of new opportunities and growth trajectories to be starting to think about like what are the ways that the employee most wants to grow that would fit with the way you you, know, you as the manager think that they need to grow 
so you, there can be a discussion of like, hey, what would be like, you know, in, in this, you know, so I don't know what the, what the example would be, but if I were, um, you know, talking to someone say about like, if you, if you thought that maybe their, uh, contributions in the meetings that they could be more assertive. So then that would, rather than just giving it as a criticism, like, Hey, you're not very assertive in meetings. You know, it would be something like, you know, maybe you could take more, take more chances in meetings and presenting your ideas to the team or to be like, you know, or to be uh, displaying that sense of confidence, you know, in, in meetings by presenting ideas and then letting people question you on them. And so it could be that being able to present ideas clearly and succinctly and then have people challenge them is exactly the thing that you need. Uh, you want to help them form an image of where they are not yet. I think it's so it's, you know, crucial that people have a sense that like there's something they're stretching for. There's, there's these qualities, not outcomes. There's some, these qualities of how they could be that you're going to help them to think about attaining. But well, then you're just there. It's like the coach is just helping them break it down into steps, think through it, identify the pain points, identify what will be easier, and then also the highest ideals that could be inspiring that change. Mm -hmm. and that's how what we talk about in the coaching class being encouraging. Right. I've also found it helpful. Like if if you notice something that you can bring it into that understanding phase where you're letting them explain, you know, their own. Uh, approach and where they think they want to grow. And then you can ask, you know, one of the things we talk about is asking good questions, yeah. A, to draw out more of their experience, but you can also bring up this situation that you've noticed and see if, is that something that they see as an issue or is that something that they want to be working on? Um, so I've also found it helpful to, to approach that there. Yeah. I mean, and imagine those interactions. Um, imagine on the one hand going into it, if you had zero confidence that they could improve in any way. Just imagine how, like, what would that feel like to talk to someone about their growth, you know, with, with no confidence? It would be very hard to pull off, right? And probably wouldn't help the person. On the other hand, like, what if you were absolutely confident that they had it in them to be extremely good at this? Or they, like, it's like you already have in your mind the image of how they could be thriving and that's the source of your confidence. You know that they could do this, that they could be, they could have a, you know, that they could be very, um, they could live in, you know, a new kind of, I don't know, I don't, I'm always thinking of examples that may not, may not fit in a general audience, but you could, you know, you could think of like, what would it look like for this person to be shining, to be radiant in what they're doing? And you could have it very clear that you would want them or that you're confident that they could be like that. If they want to get there too, then you can start thinking about what are the steps that, that could that could outline this. But you know, you know, I don't think you'd be able to really help others to grow if you weren't confident deep in your heart that they can grow, that they have this capacity to grow, which I think everyone has. Yeah, that gets to my next question, which is, I think there is a kind of tension between the manager role. And then this this coaching role that we've or mentorship role that we've been describing, where the mentor is, you know, needs to be confident that this person can grow and helping them and so forth. But on, at the same time, they're wearing two hats because the, the other hat is the manager hat, where they need this person to produce, you know, this specific work, and they need these outcomes achieved. And you know, ultimately, maybe they can determine whether that person even stays at the company or not. Um, so, so I wonder. Can these two things, I mean, what's your thoughts on on how this this can be balanced? Because it seems like in that mentoring relationship, there can be this kind of specter of power lurking lurking over it. Yeah, and that's going to be always the nature of the manager-employee relationship, that there is the possibility that the manager decides this is not a good fit for the employee. And you could say it however euphemistically or diffemistically you know, that, that, uh, that, that, that you want. But it's uh, the in the end, the manager has not only the good of this employee to take care of, but the good of the organization. And it is the case that that the common good 
of the company is greater than, than the good of one person in it. And so I think a manager can have every display of confidence and support in helping people to be their best. But there's also the correspondence on the part of the employee. What would you do then with the employee who, despite continual encouraging, you know, encouragement and kind of collaborative planning of how they could do things and how they could grow, in a sense, like decides, like digs, you know, their feet in and says, "I, I will not." The manager could actually be displaying more confidence than I think by firing them. You know, in the sense that I'm sure that you will find a way to thrive on these things that right now we haven't been able to help you to do. But because of that, I don't see how you can con- continue here, you know, or at least give warnings and things. So I don't, th- I don't think it's always wrong to fire people. And I think that it can be done in a way that's affirming and in fact shows your confidence that they will get by and that you think that, th- that they are capable of, of rising more to meet the challenges than they have so far. Yeah, w- one thing we advise people in the uh, master class is to be less focused on outcomes yeah. and more focused on the ideals, and especially not to see the outcomes that they want to achieve as the ends in themselves. Um, but they're all j- just kind of markers or milestones as people are growing for them to kind of see, okay, am I growing in the right ways? Uh, but they ultimately want people focused on processes and ideals and strategies and being creative and flexible and so forth. Um, I mean, would you go so far as to apply that to an entire company or the the manager of a team that, hey, they shouldn't be focused on so much on whether this employee or whether their team or whether their whole company is hitting these targets, you know, these kind of numerical, we need to make, Mm -hmm. make X amount in sales this quarter, but they should be more focused on the strategies, the processes the ideals and how does that potentially affect the manager employee relationship? Yeah. So certainly there are, I know people in situations where they work for companies that pay extremely well, but who eventually fire everyone. So they know that eventually they're going to be fired. But while, while the gig lasts, it's great. And they can be saving up the, the money that they're making. To me, that's an inhuman way of working. You know, the, the, the idea that as long as you meet these numbers, we employ you is demeaning. And, and, uh, and so I wouldn't want to use the argument from the common good of the company to justify putting numbers ahead of people and to justify destroying all sense of loyalty that you have to the, the you know, employees that you have. Like, I think that you can't, so I don't think that, um, so it's true that managers and, and people running companies um, do have to protect the common good of the company. But I think it's also true that they have to be individually dedicated to the growth of every employee. And they have to have a culture of helping people to grow, um, not just like weeding people out. But it makes me uncomfortable too when when um, companies describe themselves as families, and they, and they say, you know, this is my, you know, we're, we're a family here at this company. Well, no, the, in fact, the difference is that in families you can't fire people, and that the bonds that constitute a family are permanent. And so, you know, parents might be struggling with their children and getting them to uh, to grow in the ways the parents are confident that they, they can grow. But of course, they can't fire their children. Great, Kevin. Yeah, I think that's a very important distinction to make. Uh, and then I, I guess just to f- final question here for the episode, uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on what you see as kind of the big picture ways that, you know, moving forward, psychology, CBT and so forth can contribute to flourishing in the workplace. Yeah, in fact, that's the whole project of optimal work is to bring psychological insights to the workplace. Um, What I wouldn't want to do, though, is to psychologize the workplace, you know, to kind of turn the interactions there into therapy. Um, 
I'm not sure if the workplace needs more like psychology or psychological, you know, um, jargon. I think most of what it needs is ideals. I think that what optimal work does and you know, what we try to do is, is to show how ideals are really front and center in the effort to help create culture and to help yourself to grow and help others to grow. So everything in our approach is really just how can you make ideals front and center? So like we talked about today, like being encouraging, uh, being understanding, being practical. Uh, wouldn't you want a sense in a company, you know, that people are encouraged to be compassionate, um, to show confidence in each other's growth and their ability to grow? So I think that ideals are a way of, um, they implicitly carry all of good psychology with them. Everything falls into place. The more we have a sense of aiming for ideals as the, the guiding light, the more they inspire our actions in a thousand ways that we wouldn't have been able to resolve in advance. Like It's so important that we learn to turn our attention toward our ideals. And so I think when we think about the workplace, we should just be thinking of what ideals could I be bringing there? How will, could I incarnate these ideals more fully? What would it look like for me to embody them? So you know, I think that if managers were really trying to grow themselves according to their highest ideals, it would then be much easier for them to naturally come to the assistance of employees who need help. Not that they're going to do the work for them and tell them, hey, here's what you have to do, but to show them the confidence that they there are ways that this can bring out their best. Yeah. Oh, wonderful, Kevin. I, yeah, just to finish, I just had one final thought. I mean, it seems like what we're talking about psychology in the workplace to help people work better. I mean, it's insights from neuroscience and psychology to help mm -hmm. people understand, you know, stress and, and focus and things that are relevant to their day-to-day -day work, not about making a manager into a therapist who's now going to help his employees with people with problems outside of work. Exactly. I also think it's important that we have tools that people can on their own explore and use. And it's very different for a person to go to a tool that walks them through, say, the steps of reframing, like our reframer exercise, or the steps of how to set up a golden hour. And then they find that, whoa, I just had my best hour of work. Well, having tools that you personally use is empowering. And that's different than having a person in power over you trying to be the therapist for you. So I think it's a completely different thing to make tools available for people, you know, and to try to bring ideals into a workplace than to turn the work relationships into therapy relationships. Those are completely different things. Right. Good. Okay, Kevin. Well, I think that's a great note of clarity for us to end on today. Great, Tree. Well, thanks for your questions. Nice talking. All right. Yeah, we'll be back next week. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. If you enjoyed our conversation and you're looking for more in-depth guidance, check out OptimalWork.com, our unique platform that delivers content, tools, and exercises to help you thrive at work and beyond.